This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Good evening. Uh, my name is Henry Brady. I'm the Dean of the Goldman School of Public Policy. And it's great pleasure that I welcome you here tonight for an opportunity to hear from an individual whose finger has been on the pulse of the American electorate for over 40 years. Peter Hart is going to give a lecture tonight. It's the first annual Michael Nacht Lecture in Public Policy. Let me just say a word about Michael. Michael is formerly Dean of the Goldman School of Public Policy. He's currently Assistant Secretary for Strategic Global Affairs, a great title, uh, in Washington, D.C. at the Defense Department. Uh, he is a veteran policy analyst through many years of working at the State Department, then in, at the Kennedy School, and at our school. Right now, he's been deeply involved in the nuclear posture review that just came out about two or three weeks ago, and in the nuclear summit that had something like 40 world leaders who came and talked about nuclear weaponry and nuclear uh, materials. So Michael is a distinguished policy analyst. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here tonight because, uh, as he put it, uh, he, he's actually leaving May 15th, I think it is, to come back to the Goldman School, and we're thrilled and they said to him, that's a Friday, they said, will you be leaving at 10 p.m. or 12 p.m.? So his job is a job that's been all-consuming. He hasn't had a moment uh, to really get away from it, especially given the important things he's been working on. But we really look forward to having him back and to continuing this series next year with him present. Uh, but right now, uh, we're lucky to have Peter Hart here. Let me tell you a few things about Peter. Um, among polling insiders, Peter Hart is the pollster's pollster. Nobody is better at formulating and writing polling questions. Nobody is better at interpreting polls. And absolutely no one is better at placing polling results in the context of American politics. Peter is so good that he's worked with over 40 US senators and 30 governors, including Hubert Humphrey, Jay Rockefeller, Lloyd Benson, and Bob Graham. He has done work around the world and he frequently appears on television programs including the Today Show and the News Hour with Jim Lehrer. He is truly a veteran pollster. All of you may know this. What you may not know is that he's a superb teacher. Recently, he taught in my Public Policy 101 Introduction to Public Policy class. Most practitioners who come have stories to tell and anecdotes, and it's great. They help to humanize public policy. They help to give some sense of what it's all about. And Peter did all this, but he did much more. He came with a lesson plan. He actually came with a set of goals that he had in mind, and he presented a case study of polling on raising taxes for fixing roads. Uh, the poll is one that he had done for Governor Jim Hunt of North Carolina in the early 1980s. He even admitted that his client went ahead and actually taxed and fixed the roads and then lost the election in the next election. So pollsters don't typically do that, by the way. They tell you about their successes and not their failures. Um, although in this case, it was sort of a mixed case because Jim Hunt at least did get the roads paved, which is a public policy success, even though it led to a political failure for him in the next election. Although eventually he became elected governor again of North Carolina, perhaps because he had paved the roads. Following his lesson plan, Peter led the class through his extraordinary command of the Socratic method. I've seen very few people who are as good as he is in a classroom at asking questions, eliciting ideas, summarizing them, putting them together, and allowing students to learn through their own active involvement in the class. And I think he left the students with some deep and enduring lessons, uh, in information about the nature of leadership, the nature of polling, and the possibilities and limits of public policy. And he did this all with great good humor and fantastic anecdotal detail. As a longtime survey researcher, I knew about uh, Peter's talent as a pollster. But I was also 
thrilled to find out that he's a great teacher. So, buckle your seatbelts as we all take a fast-paced and exciting ride with Peter to find out about the mood of America and the 2010 elections. Veteran pollster, Peter Hart. Thank you, Terry, very thank, much, you. Henry. thank you. Uh, I thank you, Henry. I am thrilled and delighted to be here. And I have to tell you, uh, the, uh, the honor of being able to deliver the first Michael Knock le lecture uh, is of particular uh, pleasure for me because it was Michael Knock who was kind enough as dean of the Goldman School to invite me to Berkeley uh, some five years ago and asked me to come and, uh, come and teach at the Goldman School. And that introduced me back to Berkeley, uh, which is my hometown. Uh, and uh, for uh, the last five years, uh, we have been back here uh, teaching on the Berkeley campus. Uh, my wife has been taking classes at Berkeley, so we have been taking the full advantage, and I'm only more than delighted to be here. I've got to tell you, Henry, when I get invited or somebody says, veteran pollster, oh, do I cringe, because I know what people are thinking, oh my god. 10,000 years old. Uh, I have to tell you, in my class last year, after my first class, uh, it was obviously 2009, just after, the, uh, just after the inauguration of Barack Obama, one of my young students came running up and said to me, you got to tell me, what was the most exciting election you've ever been in? Was it Obama? Was it Kennedy? Was it Roosevelt? <laughs> I looked at her in mock horror and said, Roosevelt? I wasn't even alive for Roosevelt. And she said, no, 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 I meant Franklin, not Teddy. <laughs> so uh, when, whenever, I hear, uh, whenever I hear the fact that I'm a veteran pollster, I know that it's trouble uh, because people usually want to talk to me about the Garfield administration <laughs> or something like that. But what I do want to talk to you about a lot is what's happening today, where America is going, and then I want to talk to you a little about my profession and where things are at. And this morning as I was getting ready and going over my notes, I said to uh, Florence, my wife, I said, I'm afraid this might run a little bit long. And she looked at me and rolled her eyes. And I know what the rolling of the eyes means. Uh, and she said to me, just remember what Muriel Humphrey said to Hubert. And I said, what? What was that? She said, a speech doesn't have to be eternal to be immortal. Uh, so uh, I will try and remember that. And I'll try and go through this. Uh, and give you some sense of where things are at. Uh, and let me just talk about the mood of America. Uh, as uh, Henry uh, has noted, I've been doing the NBC Wall Street Journal poll for now. This is the 21st year. We do it with Bill McInturf, the Republican pollster. And the two of us have uh, been combining on this. And the data, for the most part, is from the, uh, our most recent poll. And it sort of measures where the public's at. And probably the best place to start is really to just look at uh, a sense of what we call the EKG of American public opinion. Are things headed in the right direction or seriously off on the wrong track? That gives you a better sense than anything else about how the public is feeling. And as you can see, at the moment that the president uh, was inaugurated, uh, the public was, for the first time, feeling almost back to dead even. We've been in a total funk about the performance of America during the Bush years, certainly during uh, the second uh, term. And so at this stage of the game, we had about uh, equal numbers saying right direction and wrong track. And as you can see, as the administration has gone along and the economy has had a hard time, the American public has been more and more negative. And at this stage of the game, almost 6 in 10 Americans say things are seriously off on the wrong track. 
And obviously, that's a challenge and a difficulty uh, for the president. Some of it obviously reflects his leadership, but an awful lot has to do with how we feel about uh, how we feel about the economy in general. It should be noted that the key segment of this electorate has to be independent voters. They represent about one in five Americans. Uh, if you look at this, uh, you now have almost two thirds of them saying the country's seriously off on the wrong track. And that sort of sets the mood and against which uh, the president is challenged. But as I look at the president and his performance, the American public looks at him in so many different ways as they do with every president. And when it comes to how they feel about him as, uh, you know, first family and all of that, mood is unbelievably positive. As you can see, seven and 10 say they have positive feelings about the president in terms of that. Uh, in terms of how they see him as a person, naturally put Bo the dog in there because I figure, you know, everybody loves the dog. Uh, but 65% uh, of the public is basically uh, positive about him as a person. So on a personal level, he stands very well. The other thing that has been fascinating is on a couple of other fronts. Uh, there's been a lot of challenges back and forth. Does he have leadership ability? Can he be seen as a strong leader? Uh, at this stage of the game, the American public, a majority say, yes, I see him as a strong leader. I see him in a positive, uh, in a positive fashion, and he has done well. The other thing which is exceptionally important is that the American public believe, of him, believe him to be uh, a leader on the world stage. And everywhere he's gone, there has been a change of mood and change of attitude. Uh, the Pew Research Center does some of the best polling in America and, uh, and around the world. And one of the things they've done is check the confidence of how people feel about the president uh, overall. And if you look in terms of America standing abroad, in almost every country, uh, the mood has improved by 10 to 20 percent in terms of the country and how we feel about the United States. And it's that leadership that the public uh, appreciates. And so when he goes abroad, whether, uh, whether it is uh, to Europe or uh, to Africa or the Middle East, in every case, uh, it is a much more favorable view than we had at the end of the Bush administration. But against all of that, is, uh, is two things. One thing is how does the American public see him as commander in chief? Here he hasn't necessarily been tested, but overall the American public say as commander in chief, uh, I'm, uh, I'm more uh, divided, about half say positive, 46%, uh, uh, the rest uh, are negative. So he hasn't necessarily earned that title in part because they haven't seen him, that much in that role, even though we can talk about Afghanistan and even Iraq. Uh, and finally, in terms of his stance on the issues, this is where the uh, divide has come with the American public. Only four in 10 say, I see him in a positive fashion. So the president really ends up in two different ve venues. One is the personal side and the other is the professional side. And if you look at this report card, on the personal side, things are exceptionally favorable. They see him as easygoing, they see him uh, as likable, they see him as inspirational, they see him as a strong leader, they see him as honest and straightforward, and representing uh, American values. Overall, the average mark is 58%, a very solid and a very good mark for the President of the United States. But then you go to the professional side of the category, and the president's average rating is 43. And a way to think about this is the difference in temperature outside. Think about how you dress and how you feel when it's 58 degrees and when it's 43 degrees. Very different between the two. And if you look, uh, all of those marks sort of start where the other marks left off, 51% all the way down to 30%. Let me draw your eye to two very important findings here. One is achieving his goals, 40%. That's a very low mark. Now, let me make a point. That was pre-healthcare. 
That mark will probably go up some. I don't know how much. But overall, uh, the sense that is this a person who's accomplishing a lot, getting his agenda done, are things happening? The public's much more divided and uh, on the negative side. And more importantly there is the second element, and that is changing business as usual. And what we find here is that, what was his slogan? What do you run on? What? Change what? Change we can believe in. And if you stop and you look at this stage, the problem is people look at Washington and they say it's all the same. It's exactly as it was before. They look at, uh, they look at all the corruption, they look at all the scandals and everything else that is happening in the Congress and otherwise, and the public says, uh-uh, that's not the change that I voted for. And so the president is seen as perpetuating the status quo rather than changing. And so one way or another, the covenant that he made with the voters were, were really basically two things. One, that I'm going to get things to happen. We're going to have change. And secondly, it is going to be a different culture in Washington. He hasn't been able to deliver on that. And you want to understand why his standing is not as great. That's what it's about. Now, let me ask you a question. I figure, uh, Henry, it's all right if they do the work, isn't it? Sure. Absolutely. OK, one of the things I love to do is to ask people uh, in focus group, tell me this or tell me that about the president. And the question I asked in a recent focus group was, if President Obama could have any trait from another president in the last, since Kennedy, so I'll move it from Kennedy all the way through George W. Bush, what trait would you give him? See, you thought you were just going to get to listen, no, didn't you? No, no, I knew you were coming to this. Yeah, you saw it. Um, well, I was going to say communication, but he has that down. I OK. Think. What president, what trait? Courage of his conviction. And what president do you think? Lyndon uh, Johnson. Lyndon Johnson. How about yourself? More aggressive. More aggressive, such as? Reagan, perhaps. Reagan. What do you think? Who knew where the skeletons were. Yeah, OK. Who? LBJ. LBJ. OK, what quality, what president? LBJ, his political maneuver. OK, good. Toughness. toughness. My way or the highway, George Bush. Whoa. Yeah, George Bush. George. Blindside everything. OK. Uh, humility, Gerald Ford. Humility, Gerald Ford. Ooh, high five for that. <laughs> Not a bad answer. Uh, haven't had it before. You got one? Ruthless. Of? Of LBJ. Of LBJ. OK, you're very close. On one, you've got it. On the other, you haven't. And that is, they said Bill Clinton, they said Ronald Reagan, and they said George W. Bush. And what they said is the humanity, uh, the ability to relate, the ability on a personal level. Here's a man who's a great visionary, a great orator, but they don't feel that he relates one-on-one. -on -one. And it, this just spontaneously came from these group, uh, this group. And uh, I actually had communication with the White House uh, last week because I picked this up and I've already passed it along. But I said, how the president handles West Virginia and the, uh, and the uh, services for the miners becomes terribly important. And if you notice the pictures and the words, how human, how embracing, and everything else. And it becomes terribly important. Because I just told you, they love him as a person. They love him in terms of, uh, of first family. But the problem is, they don't see him relating to them. Second thing. Everybody in the audience, give yourself a, a round of applause. What they said was Richard Nixon and Lyndon Johnson. And it was exactly as you said. It was the toughness. It is the moxie. It is the skill. And they don't see him as having that political skill. 
And do you know what uh, one of the respondents said to me? Said if it had been Karl Rove, we would have ended up with health care in a month. Uh, it is that sense that, so the president's at this stage, he's 16 months into office. Don't get ahead of yourselves and say, oh, he's defeated, he's reelected, he's this or that. He's done a lot, he's set himself up in certain ways, but the other side of this is he has definite challenges ahead of him. So that's where the president's at. And look at those feelings. What do you think of those feelings? Pretty impressive? Four to one, pre uh, what do you think? Impressive? Yeah, yeah what do you think? What? Well, they would be neutral. Yeah. So what do you think? Four to one? You bet. That's why we love Michelle Obama. <laughs> uh, and, and indeed, what we have is an unbelievably popular first lady. Helps the president, but she, make no mistake, has been exceptionally well received. And you look at this. 73% of the American public see her as a role model. If you look at women under 35, African Americans and Hispanics, uh, it's practically total. In fact, we've got a search party. John Whaley's uh, with me from Heart Research. We have a search party to find that one African American uh, <laughs> who said she wasn't a role model. Uh, we're looking all over the country. Uh, but in any respect, what it all comes down to is you look at this administration, it's early on, there's a lot to do. Now, let me turn from this into the whole area of what's the agenda for government and where we're at. Well, you know it, I know it, and the American public knows it. And that is the number one issue is the economy. Pure and simple, it's jobs, it's getting people back to work. That's what we're concerned about most. Uh, in second place is uh, national security and terrorism, health care uh, now no longer quite at the top, uh, and deficit spending. Don't, don't miss uh, the uh, news here. That's important. I mention this because I can tell you that 2010 will revolve around the economy. I've seen the same articles that you've been reading. The economy is picking back up. People are... Uh, are happier, et cetera, et cetera. Until we start to really see it in the polls and we start to see this number go down as the most important issue, and more importantly, that 48% of the American public tell us that they've been affected a great deal or quite a bit by this downturn. And until this public starts to say, hold it, I'm turning the corner, I feel safe, and at this stage of the game, half the American public say, we haven't hit bottom yet. And until we get to that side, uh, the Democrats are going to have a tough draw in 2010. And if you don't know anything else, watch one number, and I can tell you how this election is going to turn out, and that is the unemployment number. If that number is hovering at 10% and above, the Democrats are going to get slammed. If it starts to get down to 9%, the Democrats may lose but not be slammed. If it gets below that, the Democrats will not have as bad a year. But 10% or more, the Democrats are going to have a hard time. And the point here is, at the beginning, the American public said, look, uh, the situation that the president uh, inherited uh, was something that he inherited. At this stage of the, uh, at this stage of the game, Two-thirds of the American public say it's something he's inherited. By the time we get to election day, a majority will say it's his. So it's going to be his, his situation sooner rather than later. My co polling compatriot, uh, Bill McInturf, makes a great point, and this is a chart that he often uses. And for years and years and years, and Henry, you'll know this better than anybody, the Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index has always been the gold standard to understand how the economy is doing and where things are at. And uh, if you look, we measure uh, how people feel. And at this stage of the game, the overall consumer uh, confidence index is at 69.5. But what Bill has done is he's gone back and he's looked at the period of time that it has taken for the economy to recover between when it 
fell below 65, which really says uh, deep recessionary time until it rose above 85, which is getting back to Compton. And if you look, uh, we went uh, essentially 30 months uh, in 74 to 76. What happened in the 76 election, Henry? We threw out the incumbent and we brought in Jimmy Carter. Then we went into another recession in 1979 that lasted 45 months, essentially from July of 1979 through the midterm elections in 82. And what did we do? We threw out another incumbent, Jimmy Carter. Uh, uh, did I say Jimmy Carter the first time? Well, I meant that we threw out Ford. You know, we knew that we threw out an incumbent. And then what happened, we went back into another recession in the early 90s, and essentially uh, we threw out George H.W. Uh, Bush in 92. It has always been a bellwether for how we're feeling and where we're at. And if you look, we're now 23 months into this recession, and essentially we have no long, we have no idea how long it's going to take us to get back to above 85. But I can guarantee you, this is going to tell us more than anything else about how this president is going to do and how uh, and how the congressional elections will go. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on health care. I just really wanted to simply mention it to say, look. Uh, when we went into this, this has been a polarizing issue, and as we went to vote, the American public was absolutely divided. And what you found out is three quarters of the Democrats said, pass this thing, and four out of five Republicans said, don't pass it. And so the, what you saw happen in the Congress was nothing more than a reflection of public opinion. And the importance about all of this is that the ability to reach consensus is so much more difficult at this stage, and we can talk a little bit more about this. But it, it make, no uh, make no doubt about this, when the American public came to uh, look at this, uh, their uncertainties became greater and greater because we always think of the fears versus what we know that we have. And that's the way the public came to look at this. Instead of seeing the opportunities and understanding what could happen, it was always the fears. Now that it's passed, public opinion hasn't changed. I believe that we really won't know about public opinion on this until six or eight weeks into this. Then we'll get a sense of is it still a red hot issue or is it something that cools? I think it will cool. The reason the Democrats voted for it and the reason it is good for Democrats, uh, leaving aside the public policy reasons which are so important, it is because it is the issue that will get Democrats encouraged and enthused about this election. And Democrats need that tremendously because at this stage of the game, Republicans have a tremendous edge in enthusiasm. And for the Democrats to be competitive, they need to be interested. They need to believe in the president even more. If there's any set of findings that disturbs me more than anything else, it is a feeling about what's happening in Washington. And the feelings about what ha is happening in Washington are as bad as any time in my public polling uh, 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 years. Indeed. Only one in six Americans say they have confidence uh, and approve of the Congress. 51% of Americans say, if I were given a choice, would I vote to reelect my, my representative or would I vote for someone new? 51% say they would vote for somebody new. It's not that they act on it exactly, but it tells you something about their mood. 46% of Americans say, I would vote for a new independent party. And finally, and most disturbing of all, is a question that I developed in the last survey. 50%, one out of every two Americans said, if there were a lever on this ballot that allowed me to vote out every single representative, including my own, I'd pull that lever. Now, they can't do that, but the reason I put it in is it was the best way to tell the story of how much anger, 
how much unhappiness, uh, where everything is at. And all of this has, is just exacerbated. Everybody's been watching the, the news. What are you thinking about the financial reform? Anybody have a thought about this as you're looking at this debate? Anybody out here? Not going far enough. What else strikes you? And the problem is, if you're the American public, you're looking at Goldman Sachs and you're saying, this is a rigged game. I want it to change. And then they turn around and they look at the Congress and these guys can't even agree to start a debate on this. It infuriates the American public. And then they look and they say, oh, I recognize all these people. Every one of these people is part of the hall of shame. You know, they've either been indicted or there's some sexual scandal or there's something one way or another. And these are representatives uh, in the United States Congress. And what is fascinating and so important in terms of things is what's happened in our society. Andy Warhol, what's his great statement? 15 uh, minutes of fame. Here we go, high five. 15 minutes of fame. And what was that all about, Chuck? Mm. Mm. That's, all That's, all That's, all That's all you get in life. Everybody gets to be famous for 15 minutes. Remember these people? Ah, baby Jessica fell down a well. That's all she did. But she'll always be known for that. How about who can get the name of the fan? The fan who interfered. Ah, uh, Steve Bartleman. OK, and who will ever forget Elian Gonzalez? OK. That's his 15 minutes of fame and Private Lynch, saving Jessica Lynch. OK, that's what it was about. You did something, and you became known for that. And that's where things were at. But where are we today? 15 minutes of shame. Stop and think about it. It is whether it's Tiger Woods, or John Edwards, or Toyota, or AIG, or Goldman Sachs, we go from the top to the bottom like that. And it is a society that is judging as harshly and as tough on everybody. And it is a sense of where do I get confidence in institutions and what do I believe in? And that's what we're looking at and that's what's so difficult about our society. We look and we say, how are we going to put it back together, and what are we going to do? And until we were able to have confidence not only in the system of government, but the system of business and the, uh, and the system of commerce and the system of the church, you can go through each and every athletes, et cetera. Uh, we lose all of that. Let me bring you to the final slide, and that is, uh, uh, politics 2010. If you look at this, this chart on the left tells you everything you need to know. 67% of the Republicans can't wait for this election to happen. They are excited, they are enthused, and everything else. And among Democrats, it's 46. A difference of 21 points. David's shaking his head because you know what it means. And you look at this, when you ask in our NBC Wall Street Journal poll, tell me uh, how you, who you would prefer to have as leading the Congress in 2011, uh, the, Demo the Democrats have a three-point advantage. But if you only look at those people who have high interest in this election, essentially the Republicans are ahead by 13 points. So if you wonder how the election's going to turn out, that's all you need to look at. Now, I haven't looked at this post-healthcare debate, but it is exceptionally important. And I do all of this as a way of saying, here's where we are, here's where things are about. But there's one other thing uh, uh, that I want you to know. <laughs> Who is it? Mae West. And what did Mae West said? What was her 
her great thing? She's the one who knew about elections. And she said about elections, given the choice between two evils, I'll take the one I haven't tried before. <laughs> OK? Uh, and uh, I think this may well be a May West election. If I can turn from the, for the moment from all of these charts and slides in terms of where we're at and turn now to just my profession and what I, uh, what I look at and what I do. And uh, you know, I can't come here and do a lecture on Michael Knox uh, a lecture and not talk in some reflection about the polling profession. Uh, I, you know, I have to tell you, uh, this is my 46th year in the business of public opinion. My uncle, Joseph Branston, gave me an introduction uh, to, uh, to Lou Harris, and, uh, and he was the pollster for John F. Kennedy, founder of the Harris Poll. Uh, he must have been very impressed with me, because I've got to tell you, he offered me a job at $2 an hour to be a, uh, a coder, which is the equivalent of being a copy boy uh, on a newspaper or whatever else it is, to work in his New York City uh, uh, headquarters. And I got to tell you, I'm one savvy guy because I accepted that offer. Uh, and uh, I have to admit, it was the only offer I had. Uh, uh, but I learned every single element of the polling business. I did everything all the way through. There was no element. I did the interviewing. I did work on the computer. I did work on the sampling. I did work on election night coverage. I did every element. And uh, I've got to tell you that I'm forever indebted to Lou Harris, not only for teaching me the business, being a mentor, and also, at age 29, saying to me, go out and start your own public opinion polling firm. He obviously. Uh, had figured that I had to earn more than $2 an hour eventually. Uh, so that's where it is. I also have to say I'm indebted to my, most indebted to my wife. Uh, and she indeed uh, relates very much to my polling firm because she has a single distinction of being the first person I ever terminated at my firm. Uh, she came in, she volunteered uh, one day to help me out before we were married, and she agreed to type. Unfortunately, she was too slow as a typist, and I told her uh, I was done with her uh, as a typist. But as a, as a wife and as somebody who has allowed me to do this profession, I am so thankful. But this isn't going to be a trip down memory lane. Instead, I really want to talk about where we are today and the challenges. And I talked to a lot of my colleagues at Heart Research, and I said to them, what do you think the challenges are and where we are? And I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, but let me start by saying, look, in our profession, many of the firms that I deal with, I work with, and who are competitors are among the best professionals. And in the academic community, there are sensational people and I'm honored to be associated with it. But when I started 50 years ago, let me just tell you that every interview was done door to door. And it didn't make any difference whether you were in Abilene, Texas, or in Zanesville, Ohio. There was a cottage industry across this country where you did interviewing. And it made all the difference in the world. And uh, I mention that because it took longer to do a poll. Today, we do polls instantaneously. And you say, well, isn't that better? We can, get, we can get opinion absolutely so quickly. Problem is, we no longer give people time to reflect on an issue or a problem. And instead, we immediately poll somebody on something and say, we've just found out where public opinion is. Not necessarily. We found out what somebody's instant reaction is, and that's not necessarily uh, good public opinion. And, uh, and I think, as much as anything, we need to reflect on a few of the elements that are coming and the things that are happening. First and foremost is the whole area of sampling and finding respondents. All of you look 
at a poll and you say, the margin of error is plus or minus 3% or whatever it may be given in a given poll. But that assumes one important fact, and that is there's a sampling universe and there's a sampling frame. And from that sampling frame, you can do a sample which allows every person an equal chance with every other person to be interviewed. And, uh, and that's what we call random probability sampling. Uh, problem is, we now have elements that are changing all of that. Internet surveys. Anybody been a respondent in an internet survey here? Quite a few of you. Is it as accurate as a telephone poll? What do you think? What? Depends on the demographics. Depends on the demographics and back Back behind you, yep. I would say you have more time to reflect uh, like way back when, or I would say more accurate. More accurate, okay. How many agree, more accurate, internet polling. Thank you in the back, thank you over there. Uh, each of you have bought a painting uh, uh, for putting up your hands. Now, uh, let, me, let me just say, the problem is we don't have a sampling frame, and that's the disadvantage. And without a sampling frame, you can't have a margin of error. Uh, because essentially, uh, in most cases, what we have is self-selection. And the challenge here is that there, uh, there is no way to be able to have a sampling frame by the internet, uh, at least at this stage. And what companies have done, in some cases the best, they have gone out and created a database by phoning people and saying, will you participate? In doing so, they reach people who don't have computers. Good news. Then they send them a computer so that you can be part of my internet database. So now you can't criticize them that we've left out a whole portion of the population that doesn't have internet, which is obviously a problem with a lot of the polls. The difficulty is, they're no longer the same person after three or four months. They're now internet users. So we went out to get them to fill a void, but they don't fill a void. We, so that's one element, and that's, you talk about the reflectiveness. Yeah, it may be much more reflective in terms of the question, but we don't have the same frame. Second thing is you look at uh, telephone polls. We have a harder and harder time getting respondents. What's a bigger problem with telephone polls today? People don't answer them. That's one, but cell phones. cell phones. And here's the question. How many of you here have only a cell phone and not a landline? OK. Take a look around. OK. <laughs> now, here we go. How many of your children have a cell phone and no landline? That's the point. There is a huge population. And we're working on getting cell phones, and uh, it's an important element. But all of this comes to the important part of framing and challenging. And we're going to have to find blended technologies. But a lot of the polling that we're doing right now is, uh, in terms of sampling, not as rigorous and not as good as it used to be. I'm not saying all of it, but an awful lot of what you read. Second problem in polling is what I call nomenclature. And let me explain. And that is, we have just one term to describe the collecting of public opinion. And it's called a poll, OK? And we can't differentiate between, quote, good polls and bad polls. They're just polls. Now, when one of you has your fabulous, darling, da five-year-old daughter or granddaughter, and they scribble on a piece of paper, we don't label it as art. We label it as scribbles. But if this same five-year-old was to walk around the block and get the opinions of 10 people, we would say she just finished doing a poll. And even worse, the local media 
would be likely to cite it as the latest poll. And so my problem here is we've got so many difficulties and we only use one word and it's called a poll. And the problem is we don't police the field the way we should. And given all of that, the public becomes more and more skeptical. In today's society, with the proliferation of polls, unfortunately, we have more and more five-year-olds that are scribbling, and we call it art. Uh, and what is, needs to be done, as much as anything, is to find a better way to police this and a better way to be able to describe it. The third thing that I want to talk to you about is advocacy polling. And to me, that's the most dangerous and that is the most sinister element within our society. Uh, if I were given a nickel for every advocacy survey that I have had cited to me or quoted, I could buy my wife that pieted hair that she's looking for in New York. Uh, I got to tell you that advocacy surveys uh, uh, may employ good survey sampling and indeed excellent interviewing, uh, but the wording of the questions, the analysis of the material can be so flawed that it ends up giving a set of responses that we think. And what's happened in our society, it doesn't make any difference if it's the left or the right, the environmentalists, the pro-life, the pro-choice, they're all doing advocacy surveys aimed at showing that their case and their cause is the right one. And my rule of thumb always is, if you see a poll where 80% or more say, that is my point of view, or that, that is the finding about the American public, I can tell you either it is an advocacy survey or it is so evident that we shouldn't even have to ask a question about it. But within this, uh, this area, uh, I've got to tell you that it is a huge problem. Finally, one final little personal peeve, and that is there is a new thing in the, in the business, especially if you read the blogs and everything else. It's called the averaging of polls. How many have seen this? Yeah, exactly. You know, they put in the averaging. Well, as a professional, who I think does extremely careful and methodological work. It is a little bit like saying, we're going to take the average of all the food in North Berkeley. So we're going to put Chez Panisse in with Burger King and tell you what the average food is. The answer is, or good wine and bad wine. Putting a lousy poll in with a good poll doesn't make, it doesn't make it an average better. All it says is you've added a bad thing. And what we need to do within this, uh, within this business is to figure out uh, how, one, we educate the journalistic community and the media community because they don't know anything about polling and it becomes terribly important. Number two, we need to be able to police our industry better. Uh, and number three, we need to be straight with the American public about what we do well and what we don't. Because at this stage of the game, it is a field where we have not taken and done the best. So I take all of this and I say to you as I look at it, our profession has tremendous challenges. But given the challenges that we have, I have to tell you that I think public opinion in a democratic society becomes exceptionally important and exceptionally uh, valuable. Uh, because when it's properly done, it provides a set of insights that I think we badly need. Without that, it becomes Michael Moore against Ann Coulter. It becomes a sense of the intemperate blogs, or it becomes the right versus the left on talk radio and the soapbox forums of the interest groups in Washington. It's public opinion that is the blend of all of these voices that get reflected. It is to help us uh, not only who's ahead or who's behind in a trial heat, but why we're behind a specific public policy and what changes 
and, uh, and uh, compromises we're willing to make as a society. And I would tell you that as I look at my career, it is public opinion polls on two of the most seminal issues of, our, uh, of my professional life, the war in Vietnam and uh, Watergate, where the public was actually ahead of the politicians and provided, through public opinion, a way to say, we're going to make a change and enough is enough. And I would say it is true also with the war in Iraq. So for all of the downsides, for all of the challenges and everything else, what I would tell you is public opinion as, uh, as both an art and a science, there is work to be done, but on the other side, at the end of the day, it is the best and most helpful way to add to a democratic society. Thank you very much. Um, let's start with some questions about the nature of the electorate. You've, you've talked some about them and try to understand a little bit better what's animating the electorate right now. You have your hall of shame and you talk about both sexual and political scandals together. Can you really put those two together? Or do they have the same animus for people or is one just sort of a personal thing and the other is really a deeper political set of concerns that people have about Congress and our elected officials? Uh, excellent question. And what I would tell you is, to be perfectly honest, uh, that uh, the public looks at all of this and it creates their sense of where are the values and where are the standards. But without a doubt, what drives people nuts more than anything else is the sense of a lack of public morality. And when I say the lack of public morality, uh, it is the sense that either using the system for their own advantage or uh, a sense of no longer serving the public. Those are the things that, uh, that absolutely drive the public crazy and it becomes exceptionally important in terms of how they look at the system. And uh, you know, there are years when I see confidence build uh, and there, those are the years usually where there's a sense of comedy and a sense of, uh, of uh, unity and getting along. Uh, actually, one period of time was after the 9-11. You could see the confidence in institutions and the feelings were much better. Uh, I want to ask several questions on this topic, but let's talk a little bit about fundamentalist uh, Christians who have been an important part of the Republican coalition and now the Tea Party activists who seem to be an increasingly important part of the Republican coalition. Are they the same people or are they different people? And what is the differences or sameness tell us about where we're going? Uh, well, obviously the uh, fundamentalist uh, Christians and the, who we often label as the religious right uh, have been a huge part of the Republican Party and indeed I think have the vetting standard uh, on presidential elections. I think it is very difficult for a Republican to win the presidential nomination without at least some uh, willingness of the religious right uh, to approve. Uh, while there are some members of the religious right uh, that are in the Tea Party movement, the Tea Party movement is very different. Uh, the Tea Party movement is much broader uh, and, uh, and I would tell you it isn't really a party, it is uh, a collection of people who are happy with the system, uh, essentially are trying to send a message as much as anything, uh, but uh, I would tell you that the potentiality of looking at this year for the Republican Party, uh, all of their hopes and all of their great expectations may be undone by the Tea Party movement because what they may have happened to them, uh, much more importantly, is that some of their uh, likely winners will lose to a Tea Party candidate or a challenger uh, will get upset and the Democrat will be able to hold the seat. So uh, the Tea Party movement I have not studied as, uh, as uh, deeply as others but uh, I see it as different from the religious right it also tends to be uh, what I would say is a whole series of unhappinesses, a lot about the government and where it, and government does. Well, tell us a little more about that. 
why are people so angry? I mean, maybe the obvious question is the economy's not in great shape, but why is it so strong, and especially why is it directed at Congress, and what do they really want Congress to do? Uh, what kind of changes are they looking for, other than throw the bums out? Well, I think a lot of it, what they would tell you is they don't want the Congress to do anything. I mean, in other words, if we had no government, uh, that would be the best government for them. But the orthodoxy, which has now become the really the most important thing to understand and evaluate, Republicans can do a hundred different things, and uh, they, some of them may get in trouble with one constituency or another. The one thing they cannot do is advocate higher taxes. And that has really become the single most important orthodoxy for the Republicans. And at this stage of the game, uh, a lot of this movement is really just aimed at taxes and the economic effect. I do not want to have to pay for this. As you know, an American dilemma has been the issue of race in America. We've now got an African American president. How much do you think the questions you ask about Barack Obama are affected by racism or racial biases and things like that, and how much does that ultimately matter for the Obama presidency? Oh, tough, tough, tough question. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, thanks for saving it for I last. I you'd like it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, my first and only lecture here. No. Uh, <laughs> Race is, uh, is one of the most challenging areas to handle in public opinion polling because of all the layers that we go through of social correctness and the answers, et cetera. However, having said that, uh, there is not, and I look to Andy Kohut, who is uh, my colleague at Pew, there is not enough evidence that we can see that, quote, there is some sort of racial advantage bias being given to the president. I will say this, that I believe that every American, and I shouldn't say every American, almost all Americans took a special pride when, uh, when, pre when Barack Obama won the presidency. I don't know if it was a cleansing, a sense of hope, a sense of whatever it was, but I believe that it was an era of good feeling. I would tell you the fact that the public feels very comfortable in criticizing him and making a differential on a whole series of different measurements says to me not that we're past uh, racial bias, but at least in terms of judging Barack Obama, the public feels comfortable in uh, mm -hmm. criticizing him in any number of areas and also giving him credit in other areas. So uh, from that point of view, it's always going to be a challenge for the profession, but at the same time, uh, I, I would have to say that uh, by and large, the public has, uh, has given some amazing insights on this. Well, thank you very much. Veteran pollster Peter Hart. Thank you.